Cataract remains the number one cause of blindness in the world. Here we see a group of patients waiting for surgery, and these are only some of the estimated 20 million people in the world who are blind with cataracts. But with a short and safe procedure, a good surgical technique and great teamwork, lives of individuals and their families and communities can be transformed. Chapter 6 is the largest chapter in the book and we recommend that you read this thoroughly. The aim of this DVD is to show in video the main parts of the procedure of firstly sutured extracapsular cataract extraction with intraocular lens implant, then sutureless extracapsular cataract extraction also with an intraocular lens, and finally a paediatric cataract surgery with an intended posterior capsulotomy and anterior vitrectomy. You should start learning and doing sutured extracapsular cataract extraction and only once you've become totally competent should you then progress on to sutureless extracapsular cataract surgery. Paediatric cataract surgery should really only be performed by a paediatric specialist. Excellent single piece intraocular lenses for the posterior chamber have been produced now for some time at a very affordable cost. It is now considered standard practice to insert a posterior chamber intraocular lens in the vast majority of cataract surgeries. We will show first a sutured extracapsular cataract extraction. At the beginning of the operation, a 4 naught silk suture is passed under the superior rectus muscle. This is done here by inserting tooth forceps closed into the upper fornix, opening the forceps, rotating the eye on the open forceps and then grasping the superior rectus muscle. The conjunctiva is picked up at the limbus with the forceps and a small cut is made with scissors. One blade of the scissors is passed into this wound and the conjunctiva is cut from the corner, keeping as close to the limbus as possible. You may occasionally need to gently detach Tenon's capsule from the sclera, but in many patients this will not be necessary. Following this, the sclera is very gently cauterized by using a hot metal rod. Or cautery forceps, as shown here. A partial thickness incision is made in the sclera about one millimeter from the limbus. It's best to make the incision in two parts, as shown in this diagram. First, a vertical incision is made with a scalpel or razor blade fragment halfway through the sclera. Then a more horizontal incision is made into the anterior chamber. Some viscoelastic is injected into the anterior chamber. The second part of this incision can be completed with a knife. It 
In this second clip, the vertical incision is made. and then the horizontal incision is completed using scissors. The scissor blades are kept at a horizontal in order to create a shelving wound. This wound will be watertight and will heal well with little astigmatism. A 25 gauge needle can be bent to make a cheap and effective cystitome. Using this needle, a series of small cuts are made in the anterior capsule from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock. This is called linear capsulotomy. Alternatively, a small series of radial cuts are made round the pupil margin. This is called can opener capsulotomy. It's best to start at the lower end of the pupil. Fluid is injected under the capsule using a blunt cannula to separate the nucleus from the cortex and to help mobilise it. An expressor and a vectus loop can be used to express the nucleus as shown in this diagram. The lens expressor presses at the lower limbus and the lens loop also presses about 3 mm above the incision. In this way the nucleus is squeezed out of the eye. Note carefully the positions of the expressor and the loop. In this case the tip of the expressor is pressing at the lower limbus. At first some viscoelastic comes out of the eye but enough stays in to protect the corneal endothelium. Just as soon as the nucleus starts to come out of the eye, then release the pressure from the lens expressor. In this second case, the shaft of the expressor is pressing at the lower limbus. You must resist the temptation to massage the expressor across the cornea at all times, keep it at the lower limbus. If the expressor presses down on the cornea like this, the corneal endothelium can be damaged. Sometimes, as in this case, the nucleus may not come out of the eye. There can be four possible reasons for this. The incision might be too small. The pupil might be too small. The hole in the capsule might be too small. Or the lens nucleus might be very large. In this particular case, it became obvious that the incision was not complete on the inside. Always remember to fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic first before expressing the nucleus.
Once the incision was completed, the nucleus came out easily. Note again the position of the expressor and the loop. The expressor is at the lower limbus and the loop is well away from the incision and above it. Again, the pressure from the lens expressor should stop as soon as the nucleus starts to come out of the eye. An alternative to bimanual expression is to express the nucleus from the eye with forceful irrigation of fluid. As the fluid is injected, the nucleus floats out of the eye. This can be done either with a cannula or irrigating vectus, which is placed just behind the nucleus in front of the posterior capsule. It is important to inject the fluid continuously to avoid damaging the posterior capsule. As the fluid is injected, it forces the nucleus out of the eye. The position of the irrigating vectus is very important. The loop rests just behind the nucleus, pushing neither up nor down. The shaft presses backwards on the posterior tunnel wall and so opening up the tunnel. The eye is rotated downwards using tooth forceps, either as shown here or else placed at the lower limbus. After the nucleus has been removed, a suture is placed near each end of the wound to help begin the closure of the wound. These sutures, like all corneoscleral sutures, must be radial and not too tight or they will distort the cornea, causing astigmatism. Make sure to leave enough room to insert the lens and carry out further intraocular manipulation. A manual irrigating aspirating cannula is a reliable and inexpensive way of removing the remaining lens matter. The lens cortex is drawn into the aspirating port and can be removed from the eye. The aspiration port always points upwards which reduces the risk of posterior capsule tears. It's important to have a good red reflex. A combination of irrigation and careful aspiration removes all the lens matter. Aspiration is carried out through applying gentle suction to the syringe between your thumb and forefinger. The purpose of this diagram is to show what to avoid during the irrigation aspiration process. First avoid pressing down onto the posterior lens capsule as this is likely to rupture it and result in vitreous loss. Secondly, watch the shaft of the cannula and where it enters the wound as well as the tip. Don't let the shaft press upwards or downwards on the lips of the wound. Thirdly, avoid rubbing the cannula against the very delicate corneal endothelium. If the endothelial cells are damaged either by direct trauma from surgical instruments, the eye will look like this postoperatively. Or even worse like this, with permanent corneal opacification and a painful eye with poor vision. The corneal endothelium is a very delicate structure that must be protected at all times. A viscoelastic substance such as methyl cellulose can be injected into the eye before the implant is inserted. Viscoelastic makes the surgery safer and easier. HPMC is readily available. That stands for highly purified methyl cellulose. The lens implant is inserted under the flap of the anterior capsule 
so that it lies in the capsula bag. The leading haptic with the tip pointing to the left is introduced through the linear capsulotomy followed by the optic. The lens is dialed clockwise whilst pressing it backwards and compressing the lower haptic. As the lens rotates clockwise, the lower haptic slides up under the upper leaf of the anterior capsule. Once the intraocular lens is secure inside the eye, the anterior capsule is cut with a pair of micro scissors. It can then be gripped with a pair of fine forceps and torn across. In this second picture, the leading haptic is placed in the bag as before. and the lens rotated by grasping the upper haptic and rotating it round. The upper haptic is placed in the capsule bag. Now three to four further radial sutures are placed and rotated to bury the knots. As an alternative, a continuous bootlace suture, as previously described in the suturing section of this DVD, can be placed to close the wound. Between the sutures, a Simcoe cannula is inserted in order to wash out thoroughly all the viscoelastic and remaining cortical lens matter. The running bootlay suture is tightened before completing the knot. Finally, the conjunctival flap is brought down over the wound and secured either with cautery or a single suture. A subconjunctival injection of steroid and antibiotic given into this upper conjunctival flap helps to bring it down and secure it in place. Dealing with complications. By far the most common complication is a posterior capsule rupture leading to vitreous loss. All of the vitreous must be removed from the anterior chamber, taking care to remove it from the wound. If not, the wound will not heal well, the vitreous will act as a wick for possible infections and also retinal detachment and cystoid macular edema are much more likely because of traction developing in the vitreous. The best way of removing vitreous is with an automated vitrector. However, if a vitrector is unavailable, a sponge and scissors are the next best option. The sponge is inserted into the lips of the wound and the vitreous will stick to it. As the sponge is gradually withdrawn, the scissors are used to cut away all the vitreous strands. You can tell 